Welcome everyone on Zoom. Welcome everyone on Facebook. Welcome everyone on YouTube. This is Sunday, October 17, 11 a.m. Our 11 a.m. sessions on Sundays brought to you by the Clearwater Baha'is here in Clearwater, Florida. Now, we have a speaker today with us that is familiar and more importantly, speaking on a topic that she's come before to speak about. So we hope that in watching this, you're inspired to go look at the previous talks we've had with her. This week's speaker is Miss Eileen Maddox. Eileen was born and raised in the Northeast state of Maine in the US. Her mother, who was raised in the Millerite tradition of Adventism, studied and pondered Christian history and theology and became a Sunday school teacher of Bible history in the Universalist Church. Eileen never forgot this initial education in the Bible that she received from her mother. Always a spiritual seeker, Eileen went to various Christian churches but did not find the answers to her questions there. Then she explored New Age concepts for many years. In midlife, when the bottom dropped out of her life, she discovered the Baha'i faith and subsequently served at the Baha'i World Center in Haifa, Israel for 16 years as a researcher and writer. Upon retirement, she returned to her New England heritage and is now a writer and editor living in the bucolic state of Vermont, where billboards are banned. She describes herself as a curious student, always trying to learn. It's actually funny, Eileen, we have a, a new member of the Pinellas community from Vermont who's uh, just moved in and we saw her at Feast. It's pretty cool. Oh, so. yes, yes, yes. I heard about it. It yeah, was we, cool. Yeah, some of your brethren coming down here to warm Florida. <laughs> she did indeed. <laughs> so today's topic the coming of the glory, an update. Eileen was inspired to write a trilogy, the coming of the glory, how the Hebrew scriptures, how the Hebrew scriptures reveal the plan of God. Now, I just said scriptures. That's actually funny because you could maybe pronounce it that way if you're reading it, but that's not how you pronounce <laughs> it. <laughs> so because she could not find any study of the Hebrew prophets written in chronological order within the context of Israelite history and written from a Baha'i perspective. She decided to publish volume one in 2020 by something or other publishing. I love these names, something or other publishing. Volume two will be published by spring of 2022 and volume three a year or two after that. Upon completion, this trilogy of books will have been a 10-year project. And uh, again, I want to remind everyone, these books, the first book, The Coming of the Glory, How the Hebrew Scriptures Reveal the Plan of God. You can purchase this right now to read. The PowerPoint presentation for Volume 1 has been overhauled and updated from the version she presented some time ago. To lay the foundation for monotheism and the Hebrew prophets, this program starts at the end of the last ice age with, now please, drum roll, um, if I say it wrong, Gobekli Tepe in yes. 9,600 BC. Is that how you pronounce it? Yes, it is. Beautiful. And then a Neolithic village. It explores the background to the famous biblical verse, what hath God wrought? Possibly the first prophecy in the Hebrew Bible and its meaning for Baha'is. This program follows the missions of the prophets Adam, Abraham, and Moses and ends with remarkable prophecies of David, whom Abdul Baha referred to as a prophet alongside Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. Jeremiah here, in the talk as Clearwater Baha'i, as you can tell you about his name, maybe <laughs> Jeremiah, because volume one is about 70,000 words. Eileen can only dip into a few fascinating topics during this 45 minute program. Of course, we'll have questions, but that's not going to cover it either. Her writing and presentations are designed 
to encourage readers to explore the Bible for themselves. Eileen's cerebral lifestyle is balanced with a serious study of ballet and the reading of thriller mysteries. So what kind of books do you read, uh, Eileen? Like Nancy Drew? Well, I've gone a bit beyond that. Right now, Louise Penny is wonderful. Okay. And the Andy Carpenter series. I don't like the gruesome ones. I like the ones with a little more humor, but Mm -hmm. intelligence. Sounds good. Sounds good. So like the Marvel movie of uh, thriller mystery books. Yes. And I love the Marvel movies too. Sounds good. Sounds good. Yeah. We, we always like that pick me up humor that picks you through <laughs> them, the actual yes. story. Yes. So because volume one of these three volumes, which volume one has been released, is about 70,000 <laughs> words. We're only dipping into a few topics. Just want to remember this for everyone. And uh, we're going to do that. And again, questions are welcome. So the coming of the glory, how the groundwork was laid for Baha'u'llah from Gobekli Tepe to David starts with the divinely inspired, the Paleolithic temple site of Gobekli Tepe from 9,600 to the 7,000s BC and animism then goes through the Neolithic phase with the tiered cosmos to the prophet Muhammad and Mesopotamia with this explosion of civilization of its spring to summer and the cults of the deities and the development of warfare as we know it during its fall and winter. Then the prophet Abraham and then the prophet Moses and the Mosaic code finishing with David whom Baha'u'llah recognized as a prophet alongside Isaiah and Ezekiel and his prophecy about Akka and the strong city. In quotes, the strong city. So with that being said, I think we've uh, done quite a bit of an introduction here, bringing people up to date, reminding you that this is based off a book called The Coming of the Glory, How the Hebrew Scriptures Reveal the Plan of God. Let's uh, move with this presentation, dear Eileen. Less. So I hit share screen mm-hmm. and I bring this up. Right. And I'm going to move this a little bit. I go to slideshow. Yes, ma'am. I go to uh, start from the beginning. Yes. And we've got it. And if you could possibly. Um, delete uh, all the people that I see on the right side. Do you see them? You mean the view options? Yes, yes. I, I don't, I think that uh, the live feed doesn't show that, but our feed does. I, I don't, we'll, we'll work on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah you, you guys, that's a feature of Zoom. It's okay. Just go ahead and continue with the presentation. Okay. Well, I want to thank you, Jeremiah, very much for a wonderful introduction. And if the cats behave themselves, and I think they will because they're napping after having received a supplementary breakfast, uh, we will go right ahead. Why did I write the trilogy, The Coming of the Glory? As Jeremiah said, because I could not find any books in the Hebrew Bible and its prophecies that were written from a Baha'i perspective, and that also presented the material in chronological order within the historical context of Israelite history. You know the old adage, whoever gets the idea gets to do it. So I took on this project and it will be about a 10 year project after it is finished. And yes, it will get finished. Yes, this program is about Bible study. Now, some people think that Bible study is boring. I think it's exciting. What did the two trees in the Garden of Eden mean? Did Moses make a prediction about 1844? I will dip into several fascinating prophetic narratives. But first, 
let's examine some background. I wrote The Coming of the Glory from the perspective that God, the creator of the universe, the earth and all upon it, especially humanity, has always nurtured his creation. Prophets of God have come at one time or another to all the peoples of the world. Each prophet repeating the eternal spiritual truths, each prophet teaching to the level of the people and giving new teachings and laws appropriate for their time, each prophet releasing energy that spurs spiritual growth and also civilizational and cultural development, and each prophet's dispensation progresses through what we call the spiritual seasons. Here's an illustration of the spiritual seasons. The coming of a divine teacher is the spiritual springtime of freshness and new growth. Then comes a divine summer of fruition, the consolidation of new teachings and the maturation of spring's efforts. Inevitably though, in time, the essence of the prophet's teachings are mostly forgotten, remembered primarily through folklore and mythology. Winter. <clears throat> is that desolate time of perversion of the spiritual teachings <clears throat> of systemic corruption and immorality. Winter is war, materialism, gross spiritual inequality and false gods. Now here's a map of where we're going to be going today. Here is Gobekli Tepe, which was in Southern Turkey at the time. Charles Holyak, Karadak, also in Southern Turkey. Karadak was where the first domesticated wheat was found. Babylon on the Euphrates River in Suma. Ur, where the, where the prophet Abraham was born and the Persian province of Elam, where the Bab would be born. Egypt, out of which came Moses, leading his people to the Sinai Desert, to the land of Canaan and Moab, where we'll hear about Balaam and his donkey. Context is very important. To find the context for the Hebrew prophets, I started with the Paleolithic monuments at Gobekli Tepe. The building of Gobekli Tepe started about 9600 BC, a monumental temple site of 22 acres that was built at the end of the last ice age by Paleolithic hunter-gatherers. Yes, Stone Age people. Partial excavations show that the site was laid out in rings with large monoliths inside weighing many tons. Surprisingly, mankind was emerging from over 2 million years of hunting gathering with a vocabulary of spiritual imagery and a capacity for huge logistical efforts to build a complex religious site. These monoliths had carvings of abstract symbols and animals central to their lives and also totemic images of power and intelligence. These carvings show a reverence for the natural world that suggests animist worship, the belief that the spiritual power of the creator flows through all of creation, thus uniting humankind with the rest of creation. Archaeologists had traditionally believed that the Neolithic revolution preceded temple building because only subtle communities supposedly had the specialized labor and resources to devote to it. But Gobekli Tepe turned that belief upside down. What a marvelous acknowledgement of mankind's innate drive to know his creator and to find his place within that creator's world. 
The phenomenon of Gobekli Tepe strongly suggests that a divine teacher stimulated the consciousness of these Paleolithic hunter-gatherers to express outwardly their spiritual beliefs. These teachers, whom Baha'is called manifestations of God or prophets of God, catalyze human spiritual, cultural, and social development. Gobekli Tepe, 9600 to 8000 BC, and the Neolithic revolutions started in the Middle East about 8500 BC, and there was a certain amount of overlap between the two. The Neolithic revolution was a transition from hunter-gatherer to the domestication of crops and animals. People settled in villages and towns. Paleolithic people had lived in small groups with relative freedom and equality and lots of space to wander in, while Neolithics lived in settlements and developed social and economic hierarchies. Domestication of plants and animals resulted in a lot more work. Poorer diet, diseases that developed from domesticated animals, and a significant loss in height and longevity. Was this change really progress? Why give up farming? Why give up the 20 hour work week and the fun of hunting in order to toil in the sun? Why work harder for food less nutritious and a supply more capricious? Why invite famine, plague, pestilence, in crowded conditions. Why? Because the hunter-gatherer lifestyle was too limited for humanity to develop its potential and reach its destiny for spiritual and cultural growth. As Abdul Baha said, change is a necessary quality and an essential attribute of this world and of this time and place. One Neolithic town was Charlhoyuk, inhabited from 7,500 to 5,500 BC. Three to 8,000 8, people lived in crowded, unhygienic conditions. There were no alleys between the buildings. Homes were accessed through holes in the roofs and ladders. The roofs were the traffic ways. Livestock pens were just outside the walls. Surprisingly, Chalhoyak lacked public buildings and any evidence of a priesthood. No remains have been found of administrative centers, temples, or elite quarters. Interior decorating and burial customs tell us a lot about religious beliefs. Skulls, tusks, and horns of wild animals were featured inside homes. Perhaps the forgotten nostalgic days of the hunt were being sanctified, reflecting an inner conflict about domesticated life and an idealization of the hunter-gatherer lifestyle. Well, how many of us fantasize about returning to the simple life in nature? And a few actually do. Archeologists speculate that the architecture symbolizes belief in a tiered cosmos where a subterranean level is inhabited by spirits and spirit animals. The sky has its own spirits and an intermediate level is where humans live. Ladders were not only functional, but could have represented ascent to a higher realm. Certain persons were buried underneath platforms in the homes possibly to protect the home from the negative spirits of the underground. Possibly ancestor veneration or worship was involved. How authentic is the Bible? We are now coming upon the Garden of Eden. You must know the Old and New Testament. You, mu you, mu you know 
the Bible is not wholly authentic and in this respect cannot be compared with the Quran and should be wholly subordinated to the authentic writings of Baha'u'llah. The Baha'is belief that God's revelation is under his care and protection and that the essence or essential elements of what his manifestations intended to convey has been recorded and preserved in their holy books. And note that books is plural. And Abdul Baha said, you must know the Old and New Testaments as the word of God. The Garden of Eden, Everyone knows the creation story in Genesis and the saga of the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve and the serpent. The Baha'i perspective is that Adam was a prophet of God who initiated the 6,000 year Adamic cycle, also called the prophetic cycle, that started with him and lasted through Islam to be completed with the advent of the Bab in 1844. The Universal House of Justice wrote, Hail with feelings of humble thankfulness and unbounded joy, opening of the holy year, commemorating the centenary of the rise of the orb of Baha'u'llah's most sublime revelation, marking the consummation of the 6,000 year cycle ushered in by Adam. glorified by all past prophets and sealed with the blood of the author of the Babi dispensation. If you do the math, you can figure out that Adam the prophet must have appeared shortly before 4000 BC. How best can we understand the, uh, the Adam narrative? Abdul Baha wrote, as to the record in the Bible concerning Adam's entering paradise, his eating from the tree and his expulsion from the temptations of Satan, these are all symbols beneath which there are wonderful and divine meanings not to be calculated in years, dates, and measurements of time. Likewise, the statement that God created the heaven and the earth in six days is symbolic. The texts of the holy books are all symbolic, needing authoritative interpretation. The conventional wisdom is that no record is left of Adam's teachings and that the Genesis story is mythology. I respectfully disagree. There is a record. It's the Genesis account, if we learn to understand it. The, God, the Genesis account is a symbolic record of the dispensation of Adam. First, let's focus on the duality of Adam. In the Baha'i writings, the term Adam is used symbolically in two senses. The one refers to the emergence of the human race, while the other designates the first manifestation of God as the duality. This can cause confusion between the two. For example, Adam, humanity, had been living in primitive ignorance of what we would call a moral code of good and evil. Paleolithics and Neolithics had always had rules of conduct to reduce conflicts, but now it was time to move beyond that level with the prophet Adam. And the Bob said, in the time of the first manifestation, the primal will appeared in Adam. Therefore, Adam did not fall. He entered. He voluntarily left the spiritual realm of his pre-existence to enter human society to start a major cycle, the prophetic cycle of the spiritual education of mankind to prepare it for the next cycle the universal cycle of the Bab and Baha'u'llah. Elena Maria Marcella was a Baha'i scholar who wrote in the 1960s. She pondered on the confusing idea 
that Adam was overcome by Satan, thus necessitating Jesus coming to redeem man from that sin. She wrote, but if we consider seriously that Adam was the garden of innocence filled with childlike unwisdom rather than wisdom and governed by a primitive code, which was lawless by comparison with succeeding moral codes, we can see how Adam himself, by laying down the first moral law for mankind, also made man capable of sin. That took my breath away the first time that I read it. It was one of those aha moments. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the Garden of Eden could be considered a learning curve it, and that we have been using ever since. It was the beginning of progressive moral codes for this cycle. Mankind would graduate from social norms to an understanding of morality from a higher source. The serpent represented attachment to materiality, a phase through which humanity must go through since it lives in a material world. Adam was man's lower nature. He would toil the earth and the earth would produce thorns and thistles or the challenges of life. Eve, representing the human soul, would experience severe pain as she strove to give birth to higher spiritual consciousness by following divine law. And let's look at the tree of life, the second tree in the garden. Abdul Bahar explained, by tree of life, is the highest degree of the world of existence, that is the station of the word and his supreme manifestation. That station was indeed well guarded until it appeared and shone forth in the supreme revelation of his universal manifestation. For the station of Adam with regard to the appearance and manifestation of the divine perfections was that of the embryo. The station of Christ was that of the coming of age and maturation. The dawning of the most great luminary was the statement of the perfection of the essence and attributes. This is why in the supreme paradise, the tree of life is the expression for the center of absolutely pure sanctity. That is to say, of the divine supreme manifestation. From the days of Adam until the days of Christ, they spoke little of eternal life and the heavenly universal perfections. This tree of life was the position of the reality of Christ. The tree is also understood as the station of the universal manifestation. Baha'u'llah wrote in the Tablet of Ahmad, Verily, this is that most great beauty foretold in the books of the messengers, through whom truth shall be distinguished from error, and the wisdom of every command shall be tested. Verily, he is the tree of life that bringeth forth the fruits of God, the exalted, the powerful, the great. The dispensation of Adam released tremendous energy for the advancement of the Neolithic people living in Mesopotamia. Neolithic culture experienced a massive leap forward in development from this scene to this scene of a Sumerian city-state. The revelation of Adam triggered a flowering, an explosion, of civilizational advancement, science and technology, the magnitude and speed of which would not be seen again until recent history, when another explosion of science and technology, cultural and civilizational growth was triggered by the revelation of Baha'u'llah. Here's a partial list of the advancements in Sumerian civilization 
during its divine springtime and summer. And this is just a very short list of what they accomplished. Cuneiform wedge writing, hydraulic engineering, the plow, yokes and harnesses, donkey pulled wagons, bricks, metallurgy, wool weaving, the potter's wheel, the sailboat, the astrolabe, the pulley, lever, saw and chisel, the arch, vault and dome, astronomy, the lunar calendar, the sundial, new pastoralism like cheese, sexagesimal system of mathematics based on the number six that is still used today. Just look at the clock or your watch and you will see it being used. Inexorably, the slide into spiritual fall and winter began. Social stratification became rigid. With an emperor at the top, the nobles, priests, merchants, peasants, and slaves. Strict social codes like the Code of Hammurabi were designed to maintain this social order. Development of Mesopotamian culture also included war and the instruments of war. And humans were now domesticated, like animals, into slavery and other forms of subservience a process that is sometimes called hyper-domestication and that has continued to this day. Great empires have been built on warfare ever since these times. The religion was polytheistic to the nth degree. Well over 2000 deities were recognized. They had separate temples and their images were lavished with every attention. The purpose of the gods was to run the world, and the purpose of humans was to serve them. This setup was a pra pragmatic quid pro quo. The gods were revered, but not loved. Glorified, but feared. Worshipped, but not trusted. They were beseeched, cajoled, and supplicated as a force to be kept within bounds so that people could live their lives without malign interference. Enter Abraham, later called Abraham by God. He was born in the city of Ur on the Persian Gulf. The Quran portrays him as a rebellious and questioning youth who mocked and exposed the powerlessness of the Mesopotamian gods. However, his father, who made and sold idols for a living, was outraged, as were the townspeople. After challenging the Emperor Nimrod, he was sent into exile with his family. They first went to Haran in northern Mesopotamia, 700 miles away. And here we see Ur was down here. They went the 700 miles up to Haran. They followed the Fertile Crescent down to Egypt, and then they came back to the land of Canaan. The Lord had said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all of the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Abraham went into the future to the land of Canaan. God made an everlasting covenant with Abraham and his descendants. The land of Canaan would be theirs and he would be their God. Abraham would be the father of many nations and two peoples, the Hebrews and the Arabs. And Abraham's descendants founded five monotheistic religions, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, the Baha'i, the Babi faith, and the Baha'i faith. They all emerged from the Middle East, and today, 56% of the global population 
adheres to them. Into Moses, about 1250 to 1200 BC, the prophet Moses appeared and led his people out of Egypt into a 40 year sojourn of teaching a new dispensation of God while they wandered in the Sinai desert. Symbolically, the desert years represented Moses leading a people from a place of spiritual degradation to the promised land of spiritual renewal, from a spiritual desert into a revelation from God, the spiritual waters of God. Moses had encountered the Holy Spirit in the burning bush, which has many layers of symbolic meanings. The essence of God's message had been, so now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Neda Saidi, a foremost scholar on the writings of the Bab, commented on Bab and the burning bush. Saidi wrote, that the burning bush was a call from, of God and a symbol of divine revelation. The burning bush unites in a mystical symbol of the three motifs of fire, the tree of life, and the, the voice of God. Saidi wrote, the burning bush is one of the most significant features of the Bob's self-definition in all his writings. In the Kayumul Asma, the voice of God that spoke to Moses through the burning bush, is in fact the Bab. People of effacement, the Bab writes, hearken ye unto my call, appearing out of the point of confirmation from this Arabian youth who have addressed by the leave of God Moses upon Sinai, Mount Sinai. Saidi asserted that the Bab was the gate through which God spoke to Moses, that Moses in fact attained the presence of God through the mediation of the Bab. And Baha'u'llah alluded to his having been a voice in the burning bush as follows, saying, this verily is the heaven in which the mother book is treasured, could ye but comprehend it. He it is who hath caused the rock to shout, and the burning bush to lift up its voice upon the mount rising above the holy land and proclaim the kingdom is God's, the sovereign Lord of all, the all powerful, the loving. And Shogi Effendi wrote, Baha'u'llah is not the intermediary between other manifestations and God. Each has its own relation to the primal source. But in the sense that Baha'u'llah is the greatest manifestation to yet appear, the one who consummates the revelation of Moses, he was the one Moses conversed with in the burning bush. In other words, Baha'u'llah identifies the glory of the Godhead on that occasion with himself. Human language is inadequate to convey the subtleties of the meanings of what the Bab and Baha'u'llah wrote and what Nader Saidi quoted. We can only ponder on their mysteries. <clears throat> Abraham had gone into an unknown future following the one God. Moses led his people into a life based not only on monotheism, but also on core spiritual law and extensive codes of conduct. Moses was the lawgiver for the ages. He gave the Israelites an immense body of spiritual law far beyond the Ten Commandments, the Covenant Code, the Holiness Code, the Deuteronomic Code, and throughout, justice was the bottom line. 29 chapters of laws were all aspects of life. The divine mandate was holiness. The Lord said to Moses, speak to the entire assembly of Israel and say to them, be holy because I, the Lord your God, 
am holy. Well, imagine the implications of a bar that is set so high. Just before Moses' people crossed over into the promised land, Moses promised countless blessings if they followed God's laws and the Mosaic covenant. I will grant peace in the land and you will lie down and no one will make you afraid. You will still be eating last year's harvest when you will have to move it out to make room for the new. I will walk among you and be your God and you will be my people. But if they didn't obey, there would be many curses. If you remain hostile towards me and refuse to listen to me, I will multiply your affliction seven times over as your sins deserve. And many examples of dire events were given after this verse. If, in spite of these things, you do not accept my correction, but continue to be hostile toward me, I myself will be hostile toward you and will afflict you for your sins seven times over. The sword and the plague would be brought upon them. If in spite of this, you still do not listen to me, but continue to be hostile towards me, then in my anger, I will be hostile toward you and I myself will punish you for your sins seven times over. They would be scattered among the nations and the land would rest from them. What did the seven times over mean? In biblical counting, a day is a year and a time is also a year, and a year is 360 days. Multiply seven times 360 years and you get 2,520 days or years. From what date does one start counting? It's a two-part answer. I'll go into a little background here. In the year 732 BC, King Ahaz of Judah was facing threats from the king of Israel. This is during the time of the divided kingdom and they were always fighting each other. The prophet Isaiah counseled King Ahaz that within 65 days, Ephraim will be too shattered to be a people. Understandably, Ahaz decided he couldn't wait 65 years, and he voluntarily put Judah under Assyrian vassalage in return for protection. The Assyrians conquered the kingdom of Israel in 721, but not the kingdom of Judah. However, they did make several incursions into Judah. The last was in 676 and King Manasseh was deported to Babylon for a while. Manasseh is generally considered to have been the most immoral king Judah ever had. An idolater who put idolatrous altars in the temple of Solomon and sacrificed his son to the fire of the god Molech. In ancient times, a king's name was often used to represent the condition of his people. Some biblical scholars consider Manasseh's reign to have been the low point in Judah's spiritual history and speculate that the year 676 activated the seven times over or the 2,520 years. If you add those two numbers, you get eight. 1844 AD. Shortly before his passing, Moses gave a blessing to the Israelites that promised two more prophets of God to follow. This is the blessing that Moses, the man of God, pronounced on the Israelites before his death. He said, The Lord came from Sinai and dawned over them from Sair. He showed forth from Mount Paran. Sair was a town located at the northern edge of Judah, very close to Nazareth. The wilderness of Paran 
was on the Arabian Peninsula where Hagar and Ishmael settled and from which emerged Islam. What he was saying was he, Moses, would be followed by the prophets, Jesus and Muhammad. <clears throat> What hath God wrought? Well, Balaam's donkey didn't know, that's for sure. Balaam and his donkey <clears throat> have mostly been regarded as a children's story, but within it is one of the first instances of far-seeing events of the, to the 19th and 20th centuries AD, prophecies for our time. The conquering Israelites under Joshua had camped on the Moab plain in Ammon. This greatly upset King Balak of the Moabites, who sent for a diviner named Balaam with the message, a people has come out of Egypt. They cover the face of the land and have settled next to me. Now come and put a curse on these people because they are too powerful for me. Perhaps then I will be able to defeat them and drive them out of the land. For I know that whoever you bless is blessed and whoever you curse is cursed. So Balaam mounted his donkey and they traveled to Moab. Though not an Israelite, Balaam was a believer in the one God and he turned to God for guidance. Long back and forth dialogues ensued between God and Balaam and between Balaam and Balak. The short story is that God forbade Balaam from placing a curse on the Israelites. And Balaam told Balak, how can I curse those whom God is not cursed? How can I denounce those whom the Lord has not denounced? From the rocky peaks I see them, from the heights I view them. I see a people who live apart and do not consider themselves one of the nations. Who can count the dust of Jacob or number even a fourth of Israel? Let me die the death of the righteous and may my final end be like theirs. As Jewish history unfolded over thousands of years, the Jews did live in increasing separation from others. In fact, the modern state of Israel established in 1948 was established in separation from neighboring countries, and has only slowly taken its rightful place among the nations. Next, Balak took Balaam to the Mount of Pisgah where he could see the Israelites and begged them again to curse them. Instead, Balaam proclaimed, surely there is no enchantment against Jacob, neither is there any divination against Israel. According to this time, it shall be said of Jacob and of Israel, what hath God wrought? How clearly spoken. This famous verse from over 3,000 years ago was the first telegraphic message sent by Samuel Morse. Perhaps this time alluded to the latter days, the time of the end, which started in 1844 with the return of the Christ spirit embodied in the Bob. Was it a coincidence that what hath God wrought was sent the day after the Bob declared his station, thus making this verse globally known and, a, and also a proclamation for the coming of the Baha'i era? The Morse Code sent through wires from Baltimore to Washington, D.C., laid the foundation for developments in electronics that would lead to the internet, the system of communication that would ultimately unite the globe. Global communication was essential for global unity, the foundational principle of the Baha'i faith to be achieved. Shoghi Effendi made an interesting comment in 1936. A mechanism of world intercommunication will be devised, embracing the whole planet, freed from national hindrances and restrictions and functioning with marvelous swiftness and perfect 
regularity. Our last drop-in will be on King David, about 250 years later. People often imagine the Jerusalem of King David as a grand city. It was not. When King David conquered the fortified city of Jerusalem and made it into his royal capital, its population was about 500 to 700. It grew to about 1,000 during his reign and maybe to about 2,000 during King Solomon's reign. Slowly, the centralized systems of royal administration evolved. David did rebuild much of Jerusalem with massive building projects, but the kingdom's population was overwhelmingly rural. So why has the kingdom of David been remembered as so glorious? Because according to the Baha'i writings, David and Solomon were prophets. This was the time of the spiritual summer of ancient Israel. Abdul Baha paid tribute to David in 1912 in the US during a talk. Among the great prophets was Abraham, who being an iconoclast and a herald of the oneness of God was banished from his native land. He founded a family upon which the blessings of God descended. And it was owing to this religious basis and ordination that the Abrahamic house progressed and advanced. Through the divine benediction noteworthy and luminous prophets issued from his lineage, there appeared Isaac, Ishmael, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Aaron, David, and Solomon. The Holy Land was established, was conquered by the power of the covenant of God with Abraham and the glory of the Solomonic wisdom dawned. All this was due to the religion of God, which this blessed lineage established and upheld. David was what we would call a Renaissance man. He was a mighty warrior who defeated the hostile tribes where he greatly expanded the borders of the kingdom and built fortifications throughout the country. He maintained standing armies. He brought the Ark of the Lord or the Ark of the Covenant with the Ten Commandments in it to Jerusalem. He was a warlord and a musician. David sang songs of praise to God and played the harp. He was also a writer, a writer of psalms. There are 150 Psalms in the Book of Psalms, and 73 of them are attributed to David. We'll take a look at Psalm 24, attributed to David, 10 verses. The, Lord, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. Who may ascend? the mountain of the Lord, who may stand in his holy place. The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or swear by false God. They will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God their savior. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is he, this king of glory? The Lord almighty. He is the king of glory. It was traditionally believed. <clears throat> it was traditionally believed that this psalm memorialized the day the Ark of the Covenant was brought to Jerusalem. However, the King of Glory is one of the names for Baha'u'llah. The mountain of the Lord strongly suggests 
Mount Carmel. The tabernacle of glory was the tent that was raised on Mount Carmel for Baha'u'llah while he visited for several days on Mount Carmel towards the end of his life. The hill of God and his vineyard, the home of Elijah, extolled by Isaiah as is the mountain of the Lord to which all nations shall flow, shall flow. And by David, the mountain of the Lord. Baha'u'llah said, the king of glory proclaimeth from the tabernacle of majesty and grandeur his call. In Shogi Effendi wrote of him, David had sung in his Psalms, acclaiming him as the Lord of hosts and the king of glory. One last highlight from a Psalm of David in Psalm 60. David has evidently been defeated in battle and he pleads with God for restoration from his anger that he save the Israelites from that those who love him may be delivered. While discussing military matters, David suddenly asks, who will bring me into the strong city? Guesses abounded as to which strong fortified city was meant until Baha'u'llah explained its meaning. Lend an ear unto the song of David. He saith, who will bring me into the strong city? The strong city is Acre, which hath been named the most great prison and which possesseth a fortress and mighty ramparts. And that, my friends, is why the Hebrew Bible is so fascinating. Sometimes it's just one line here or a short verse there, or it may be a chapter speaking to us from thousands of years ago. The Bible is a treasure trove of spiritual verities and prophecies for us today in these most challenging times. I do love to hear from people who share my interest in Bible study. You can contact me by email, website, or Facebook. And perhaps someone can paste this information into the chat box. And since I am now pretty much out of words, Let's go to questions and answers. Great. So now we have actually some questions that were asked during the talk. Angela asked this question for uh, around halfway through the presentation. She asked, how can you reconcile the Bible not being wholly authentic with it being the word of God? Okay, please repeat that. How do we? The question was, how can we reconcile the Bible not being authentic with the Bible being the word of God? Ah, oh my, that's a question for the ages. The key words are symbols and symbology. And keeping in mind how science and religion must progress hand in hand. Uh, that's the, about the best answer I can give. It's a very, all I can say really is, the more I study the Bible, the more I appreciate from where it has come. And I recognize that especially when you get into the book of Joshua, which is so bloody, uh, this is primarily the work of people, how they view their history. But with very few exceptions, uh, I do see the divine spirit behind so much of what is in the Bible. 
And I think it's a journey that every person has to take for himself or herself. Uh, it's not an easy answer. Thank you for that. So there is a question about how Noah figures into the story of human civilization's <laughs> advancement. How does <laughs> Noah figure into this story? Oh my, you're really coming up with questions today. We know that Noah was a prophet of God. Uh, because the Baha'i writings say so. Wade Franson gives a very good talk on this and he looks at Noah as consolidation of what Adam brought. And that's one, sim one symbolic way of looking at it. I do not look at Noah as at all history. Science does not support it. Uh, it's important to understand that way back in Neolithic times, when the ice was melting and the seas were rising, the Mediterranean Sea forced itself through the, I forget what the name of that small land bridge is over into Turkey, into the Black Sea. And it rushed, cracked with a force of many, many, many Niagara's. And this is all explained in my book. The Black Sea had been a salt water sea. Within a year, it became a fresh water. Late, not see, late. It only took a year for that transition. People had been living on the shores of the salt water lake and they ran and their homes can still be seen, the foundations under the lake to this day. And this was a catastrophe that was uh, embedded in people's consciousness for hundreds, thousands of years, a catastrophe of this magnitude. And I think that's one of the reasons that Noah is associated with a global flood. A flood, of course, is water. And wherever you are, when the floods come, you it feels like the whole world has flooded. But water is also uh, spiritual cleansing. And Noah's Ark, I would think, could be symbolically the Ark of his covenant. And those who sought refuge in the covenant of Noah uh, came to much better ends than those who did not. Uh, very, very little is really said about Noah in the Bible. And of course, his rainbow uh, is all colors, the symbol of his covenant, maybe a symbol that even as symbolically the waters covered the earth, so does this symbol of his covenant, the rainbow, all colors cover the earth. I hope that helps. Thank you, thank you. So we have another question from Bill Fagan. Uh, two questions, I'll ask one first. <laughs> the first question is, Robert Stockman said that the gospel was sincere pilgrim's notes. So this is his take from Robert Stockman's take. Could this apply to the whole Bible, that there are sincere pilgrim's notes? I would, the short answer is no, with full respect for Robert Stockman and his research. 
I would never go head to head on this. Remember, I quoted from the writings what the House of Justice said that the dispensations of all of the prophets of God have been protected. And that means the written words. And in another place, again, in my book, I go into this. It doesn't mean that every conversation that Jesus had or that Moses had was verbatim correct. What is correct is the spirit and the essence of what they said. And to me, knowing that God has protected the dispensations of his prophets and the records, their books, that he has protected them, that gives me the faith to say, as Abdul Baha did, and I follow Abdul Baha, you must know the Bible. Old and New Testament as the word of God, with all other things uh, being considered. Second question. Yes. So the second question is, do we know anything about the kings, rulers, and the manifestations before the days of Adam? I think that we alluded to that in this talk already. But uh, just as a matter of, I guess, recap. Conjecture. No, there are no written records. Uh, Adam was the first for this cycle. Before Adam, I personally believe that uh, prophets of God have come two peoples before technically a new cycle began, or before we might say, before it began in earnest, okay? Uh, human progress was as slow as cold molasses. Well, I'm a Yankee, so I talk about molasses, cold molasses, and even slower. And I believe that prophets of God have come to various people uh, before Adam, but there's no what we would call empirical proof. What triggered the Neolithic revolution? You know, ponder it. What triggered the Paleolithic people to develop the tools that they did? I can't prove it. I can only believe it. Uh, when the writings say that prophets of God have come to all peoples throughout history, and it doesn't say after Adam, and the, um, not the Quran, but the Hadith also says the same thing, I believe. Okay, Bill. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for those questions. So we've gone through a lot of the questions here on Zoom. If anyone's asking them on Facebook and YouTube at this very moment, I apologize for missing them. But uh, we have this question here. What, in your opinion, does your study of the text and the way that you've approached it, what, in your opinion, does this contribute to the learning of people in reading the Bible? At what point should they read your writings? Should they read the Bible first? Should they read what you've written first? How does oh, it go? I would say read my book first. Volume one, which is out, and then volume two and volume three. Uh, if you wish, 
then go to the Bible itself. It is not difficult to read. For years and years and years, I didn't read the Bible because I was under the mistaken impression that it's difficult to read. It's not. Uh, what my book does is put it within a framework, which is only meant to be helpful, not a substitute. Uh, read the Bible yourself uh, and skip the book of Joshua, in my opinion. Uh, I'm hoping that this series of PowerPoint presentations that I'm developing will be of assistance. They are an aid. Uh, they are by no means a substitute. Uh, but many Baha'is and many people who are not Baha'is uh, have really never tackled the Bible. And I totally understand that. I was fortunate who had a mother who had tackled the Bible and taught me a lot. But most people didn't have that advantage. And therefore, uh, that's why I'm involved in this project. I made a commitment to it. It's to be an assist. You can start with a PowerPoint. There will be several more, or the book, or the Bible itself, or weave them all in between. Uh, the whole purpose of this is to help people get into the Bible, understand what's in it, and understand how important so much of the Bible is to us today. <clears throat> For instance, when we get to Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah, excuse me, Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah, uh, he said over and over and over and over. In fact, I counted the numbers of times he said, but they would not listen. Now, what does, and of course, he was talking to the people of his time. He was also talking to us, and I can't really go into that today, uh, but he was also to be a prophet to the nations and had many um, prophecies specifically for our times. But the way he said they would not listen, well, the summons of the Lord of hosts, those epistles were sent to people who would not listen. Baha'u'llah's dispensation was given to people who mostly would not listen. Today, when we're living in times of upheaval, immorality, war, atrocities, and it all comes down to the bottom line, they do not listen. Uh, Baha'u'llah said a lot, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> about the importance of religion, how it is so necessary. And the more our country, the Western world, and whoever pulls away from religion to secularism or goes into fanatic religion, you know, his. Spiritual history does repeat itself over and over and over again. So Dana C. has a question. Does mm -hmm. the Bible tell about these challenging and turbulent times today that we are experiencing? Could you please tell us anything you have found that Baha'i writings have revealed in your investigations? Well, again, uh, I don't want to take the time to <clears throat> rifle through the book to look them up. Sometimes it's a matter of interpretation. Uh, and sometimes the prophets are sort of speaking out of two sides of their mouth. 
uh, they're addressing their own times, and then suddenly they will go into a far future time. For instance, suppose they're speaking about the horrors that will come if they, well, go to, again to Jeremiah for this and Ezekiel, the horrors that will come upon the people of Jerusalem, the people of Judah, if they do not submit to the Babylonians. And then suddenly they will shift into a far future and they're talking about us. And I can't bring something to mind right now because it gets rather complicated. Uh, but Isaiah was very good at that too. And so was some of the minor prophets, but I just don't have time. I don't like to quote someone uh, badly and we don't have the time to really look it up. Uh, but yes, they did. And the question is, are we listening? Are we really listening to what the House of Justice is telling us today? Even, you know, the letters that it has sent in this past year to the American Baha'i community alone and others to all NSAs, which have been passed along to us, they are loaded. Are we listening? And I put myself into the uh, target for that question too. Am I reading them as carefully as I should be? Am I really listening? So Angela Louise Manso from Facebook on the Facebook live video says, George Townsend's books, Christ and Baha'u'llah, his other book, The Promise of All Ages, and The Heart of the Gospel, all by mm -hmm. George Townsend, they are appropriate readings for this subject as well. I honestly have not read Townsend. Neither have uh, I. <laughs> For the simple reason, whether it's valid or not, is it's a secondhand telling. And I prefer to go right to the writings. Uh, his books are also very dated. Uh, I would read, you know, the newer books on the Baha'i faith, such as, uh, oh, What's his name? Uh, the man, the former House member in Canada who recently passed away, Doug Martin, and another author wrote a book on the faith. I would go to the most recent ones because an awful lot of the writings had not been translated at the time that Townsend was writing. Uh, so, Always, I say, go, go to the most recent sources or go right to the primary sources. So, so there is a question from, I apologize, I am taking a look and I'm trying to See all your questions. We're getting a rush of questions here. Um, from Clearwater, Gilbert asks, is miracles associated to Jesus allegorical or are they material? Are they literal, like resurrecting the dead, healing the blind or the lepers? Is well, it symbolic? Is it metaphorical? <clears throat> right. I can't address any one specific miracle, but Abdul Baha did say that yes, they were literal. I mean, look at it this way. He was speaking at a level that the people of his time could understand. Also, a prophet of God has complete mastery 
over the material world. And this is why when we stop and consider that the Bab could have just walked away from where he was martyred, Jesus could have just walked away from the whipping and the crucifixion, but they don't. Baha'u'llah could have walked away from imprisonments, but they didn't. They all had this power, but they didn't. And yes, Abdul Baha somewhere, I, because I just read it recently, probably in some answered questions, did say that the miracles of Jesus were real. However, and Jesus knew this very well, of course, what he did, he did on whatever day was for whatever purpose. We are told in the writings that miracles are only valid for those who experience them and that we are not to fall back on them as proof of anything. Baha'u'llah did his share of miracles. Remember when he opened his cloak to one of his followers and showed them the, whatever he showed them from the next world, from the celestial heights. And the man couldn't stand it. He couldn't bear to keep on living. So he killed himself. I think he threw you himself. Mean, you mean Baha'u'llah? No, no, no. The follower that he showed, a follower of Baha'u'llah went to mm -hmm. him and asked the question, whatever. Baha'u'llah opened his cloak and showed him whatever. And probably a glimpse of the next world. And closed his cloak again. His follower was so taken back by what he saw that he cut his throat and jumped into the river or something. He committed suicide. But anyway, this is an example of what I would call a miracle to be able to do this. <clears throat> Baha'u'llah probably did a few himself, but they were meant only for the people who witnessed them or for whom they were meant. And he must have known that this particular follower of his must have known what the result would be and knew that for his soul, it would be okay. Uh, that's my guess. So there's a question from Alex Boyson who's waited patiently for his question. He says, <laughs> what inspiration do you find in the culture and history of New England, where you are in Vermont, for understanding and studying Bible history in light of the Baha'i faith? Oh, my. <clears throat> well, yes. <clears throat> Vermont is a very beautiful place, just like Norway is. Mountains, trees, rivers. I can go into nature whenever I want to. That is very helpful. And I live in a building that is very quiet, unless my cats are acting up. However, Vermont is the most secular state in the United States, only 17% of the population statistically goes to church or synagogue. So for the most part, I am surrounded by secular people. So it's challenging. Uh, I love Vermont. I intend to stay here to the end of my days. I'm very glad that I chose it. Uh, it suits me. And it's a jumping off place to go over into the mountains of New Hampshire and go over up to Maine where I have cousins. Uh, and I do that. 
and it's a tremendous respite for me. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. There is another question we have here, and I'm trying to get all of your questions. So if I miss something, I'm sorry, we're almost at time. And uh, it's 1226, we end at around uh, 1230. I see from Bill Fagan, he says he read Thief in the Night 50 years ago. And <laughs> For all this time, he was hoping for a similar book, focusing more on Judaism, and he's recently purchased your book, and he looks forward to reading it, and he thanks you for the introduction. Thank you, Bill. The Thief in the Night is one of the most glorious books ever written, uh, and of course, as you know, it was written in the genre of an investigation. And that's what makes it so wonderful. Uh, but not from the perspective that I wanted to do. I do recommend The Thief in the Night to everybody. It's almost required reading. Uh, and it's still a wonderful teaching tool uh, to give to anyone who's interested in the faith. Hi, Bill. He's waving at you. Yes, I saw it. <laughs> so uh, we also have a thank you from Sandra. She says, thank you, Eileen. Really fascinating. She can't wait to watch your previous talk and listen to it again, to this one. And lots of amazing things to ponder. Oh, thank you, Sandra. <clears throat> My voice is beginning to run out on me. I also have a PowerPoint presentation uh, that is posted on the Clearwater site from about a year ago, 1844, Convergence in Prophecy for Judaism, Christianity, Islam, and the Baha'i Faith. And you can look up that presentation also. It's a bit out of date. I have redone it and brought it up to date better, uh, but it's still worth dipping into, I think. Beautiful, beautiful. We are at time. We appreciate everyone, your patience with the questions, and more importantly, if we didn't get one of your questions, Eileen has shared in this video how to contact her. We look forward to being able to have you again, Miss Eileen Maddox. Thank you, thank you for joining. Well, I always enjoy it tremendously. Once I get started, I have fun. And for all of you who are joining us on Facebook and YouTube, you can look at our talks, what is coming up next when we have them on Sundays on www.clearwaterbahais.org. You can find talks like this, also dates for future talks and the Zoom link to join yourself. Also, please remember on Facebook and YouTube, we have these playlists where you can look at former talks by actually Eileen. And <laughs> you can also look at other speakers who have yes. Excellent amazing speakers. stories. Mm -hmm. And Eileen, yeah, yeah, she says it, excellent speakers, and uh, she's one of them. We appreciate you coming on. Again, thank you, Eileen, for covering thank a subject you. that we don't hear. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, everybody. Uh, have a beautiful Sunday, and please share.